Hey everyone, Sam here. Thanks for joining me. I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are in the world. In this video, I'm going to show you how to paint this rocky gorge landscape inspired by a place called the Kimberley in Australia. Now, I'd like to thank Andrew Tischler for giving me the reference photos to allow me to paint this. And it was Andrew's paintings that inspired me to want to paint something like this in the first place. I really enjoyed painting this and as I say in this video I'll show you some of the process. And now just before we start the video I'd just like to tell you about my Patreon channel if you'd like to learn about painting landscapes. I've got full length painting tutorial videos on there and each month you get a brand new painting tutorial video plus access to all the other ones plus loads of bonus content all for five dollars a month and I'll put the link in the description box below. Anyway let's get into the video I hope you enjoy it. I'm painting on a 12 inch by 16 inch linen panel and this is a medium weave oil primed linen that's mounted to Baltic birch and these are pre-made by a company called Sourcetech in the USA at canvaspanels.com. Now I love the convenience of painting on these panels, they're also very easy to frame and great for plein air paintings i.e. painting outdoors. So what I'm doing here is I'm sketching out my composition using a mix of Burnt Sienna mixed with Liquin Original and as I'm using oil paints for this artwork the Liquin Original helps to improve the flow of the paint and it speeds up the drying time so very often the painting will be touch dry within 24 hours. Now as I said I'm using oil paints and the brand of oils I'm using is Blue Ridge Oils. And if you want to get hold of some of these, I've put a link in the description box below. They're beautiful paints to work with and an artist quality oil. The colours I've used for this painting include titanium white, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, cadmium red, alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue and phthalo green. Now what I did with this painting, just like with all of my paintings, is I started off by painting the dark values and shadows first. And the reason for doing this is that it makes it easier to establish a tonal dynamic in the painting so we can create atmospheric depth. So this means making those more distant landforms look like they're in the distance. Now value refers to how light or dark a subject is and we'll find our darkest darks and our lightest lights in the foreground Whereas in the distance, darks are not as dark and even lights can be a bit darker as well. And that's because the value scale of which it's represented narrows. So what I did here was I started off with the cloud shadows using a mix of ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, some alizarin crimson and titanium white. And then I used those same colours for the rocks where the waterfall is in the background, but made the value darker by using less titanium white in my mixture. Now as I'm painting the occlusion shadows and these cracks in the sides of the cliffs here, this isn't quite in the foreground so the shadows aren't going to be quite as dark so I've still used the same colours that I've used in the clouds and those distant rocks there but with much less titanium white. Now as I come to painting the occlusion shadows and the cracks here in the foreground, I'm pretty much just using ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And as burnt sienna is a dark orange, when combined with blue, it creates a near black because blue is opposite to orange on the colour wheel. So I've already started to establish a tonal dynamic here and it's going to make it easier now to add the areas that are in light, as well as the reflected light on the sides of these cliffs and also getting the colours correct as well as the saturation. So I think of painting the darks first as like creating the bones or the skeleton of the painting and then when we start adding the colour that's when we're adding the meat to it basically. So now I'm still painting these shadow areas but there's reflected light as well from the surrounding area and we're much closer to the foreground so there is going to be some colour in it. I've used the same colours here as I used for the rest of the shadows and again a mix of ultramarine blue with burnt sienna, titanium white and a little alizarin crimson but I'm using much more burnt sienna in the mix to create that rusty red colour that's in these rocks. So all the time I'm thinking about the values. Now I've got the colours of the shadows roughly established here so then I'm going to start painting the areas that are in light. 
I'm using large brushes at this stage, number five flat brushes, because I want that loose painterly effect and I'm not worried about detail in the blocking in stage. There's going to be plenty of time for adding that later. So go back to the sky and clouds, I've painted some highlights in some of these clouds and then the sky here which is just a mix of ultramarine blue and titanium white. Now one of the other things I'm thinking about in this painting is creating colour harmony. So making sure that the painting looks pleasing to the viewer and the way we can do this is by using common colours throughout the painting. So I've been using the same colours for all the shadows here, albeit in varying amounts. And I've also been using the same colours in the cloud highlights, which was just titanium white and a little burnt sienna. I've also used ultramarine blue and titanium white in these rock shadows as well. Here I'm painting the areas of these background cliffs that are in the full sunlight, but I'm making sure to desaturate the colour so that it sits back in this painting. You'll see that the darkest darks in the background aren't as dark as the darks in the foreground, so the colours for those background cliffs need to be in alignment with the shadow areas so that it looks harmonious. This is where I desaturate the colour, and I've mostly used a mix of burnt sienna with titanium white, a little yellow ochre, and even a small amount of ultramarine blue if I need to desaturate it. Now I've also used these same colours for the areas of the cliffs that are in full sunlight in the midground. Again, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, titanium white predominantly, but also a little bit of ultramarine blue to desaturate and a little bit of alizarin crimson. I'm using these same colours for the rock faces in the foreground as well and going heavier on these colours, especially burnt sienna, and alizarin crimson and I'm also varying up the mix as well so in some of my brush marks here I've used more yellow ochre in the mix others more burnt sienna and even using a little bit of cadmium red as well I want to communicate those red rusty rocks that are so characteristic of this area so mainly using number five flat brushes perfect for these types of cubicle rocks and just marking in these color variations it's in the foreground here that I can use my most saturated colours because these are what are going to be most noticeable and jump forward in the painting. Now if I was to use this same colour for the cliffs in the background where the waterfall is, it would leap forward in the painting and it wouldn't look right and then we wouldn't get that receding landforms that we've got there and it would spoil the whole painting. So in general, you want to use desaturated colour for the background and then turn up the volume of the colour as you work your way towards the foreground. Now next I'm painting the water here, which is a kind of greenish blue colour. It's also reflecting some of those cliffs and the shadows in them as well. And for this I used a mix of ultramarine blue with yellow ochre, some burnt sienna and titanium white. And I'm applying the paint here with a number five flat brush. Now I normally use flat brushes and filbert brushes for most of my landscape paintings because you can get a variety of marks with them. And the brushes I'm using are Rosemary & Co brushes. I've been using these for years and they're just really versatile brushes to use. And if you want to get some, I've put a link to their website in the description box below. Here I'm painting some of the foam in the water and this was mainly a mix of titanium white with some burnt sienna. And then I begin painting in some of these ripples, which in this part of the painting is mostly reflecting the sky and that waterfall in the background. So I used the same colours as I used in the sky, which was ultramarine blue and some titanium white, but also a little bit of phthalo green in there. Now that I've established the main colours and values within the painting, I then go back and start restating some of the dark values that are in this scene. And one of the things I've done here is I start painting in some more of these cracks and fissures within the sides of the rocks and cliff faces. This is a really important, prominent feature of this landscape and is what makes this area of Australia so characteristic. I'm still using a number five flat brush here and marking in more of those occlusion shadows that are within the cracks and fissures at the sides of the rocks. And one of the other important things I'm doing at this stage of the painting is I'm laying down the framework for me to paint those more intricate rock formations later on in the painting. 
So at the moment it's just something loose to work from that once it's dry I can then start adding much more details to it. Now as I work on this cliff face that's in the foreground I'm just adding more colours to them and then I begin painting more of the suggestions of cracks and fissures as well as painting some of these other colours that are within these cubicle stones there's some bluish greys in there. I also mix in some more saturated colour, this has more red in it as well, and I'm creating texture within the cliff face. Now I finish up the blocking in stage by painting in some more of these cracks and fissures within the side of the rocks, and all up I've got a good solid foundation to work from when I start really building up the intricate details within these rock and cliff faces. Now it was at this stage of the painting that the blocking stage was complete and I allowed it to dry for a few days. I want to make sure that the surface is properly touch dry because there's going to be some really intricate details to paint on these rock faces. Now when I finish blocking in a painting, I check overall that everything is working. I Am I happy with the values? Have I achieved the atmospheric perspective? Because you'll be able to see it already even at this stage. Also, do the colours look good as well? Now in general, I keep my values and colours a little bit darker at the early stages of the painting. Then as I work through, that's when I build up the lighter layers and lighter values. And then I save my lightest values until the very end and it's usually when you apply these light values, often in this case it will be the waterfall, that that's when the painting really comes alive. I don't want to go all in with the light value colours at this stage of the painting otherwise there's going to be nowhere else to go as I work through it and the painting could risk looking rather flat so overall I keep the values of the colours darker in the earlier stages of the painting and then build up those lighter layers as I work through. Now at this point in the painting it had dried, I'd left it a few days and as this was the first time I'd painted a scene like this I wanted to take my time with it and I broke it up into manageable chunks so for this painting session I just concentrated on building up the detail of this cliff face that's in the foreground. Now what I did here was I focused on painting the occlusion shadows within these cubicle rocks and building up the detail within them. So I started off by just mixing ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna and then I'm applying the paint using a number three flat brush. Now these cracks that I'm painting here are going to serve as a bit of a map for me to work on so that then I can start painting in these individual stones and adding the intricate details to each and every one of them and they look different, all of them. So I want to make sure that it looks random and that they've all got this nice texture to it as well and some different colours in there. So I really took my time with this. I'm painting here the areas of these stones that are kind of a bleached creamy colour and this was a mix of titanium white with some burnt sienna. There's also a tiny amount of ultramarine blue there just to desaturate the colour. I'm using smaller brushes as well. I started using number three flats and filbert brushes, also number two flat brushes as well. Filbert brushes are great because they have a rounded edge so you can get finer marks with them, as well as the broad marks as well. When I was painting this, I'd mixed up a load of colors on my palette and mostly a mix of burnt sienna with titanium white, some ultramarine blue. There's also some yellow ochre in there. I also mixed in some alizarin crimson, some cadmium red and even in some cases some cadmium yellow and I didn't mix all these colours together, I kind of made lots of different piles with varying mixtures but these are the main colours that I've used in these rock faces here and some of these cubicle stones I made more on the red side and then some of the more orangey yellow colours, just varying them up so that it looks random and pleasing to the eye. I was just taking my time building up the details within them, keeping in mind where the light source is coming from as well. And although using different colours, keeping it generally a similar value. Now another thing I did here was I also painted some reflected light and slightly lighter colours in some of these occlusion shadows within the cracks. So a mix of mainly ultramarine blue with some titanium white, a little burnt sienna and alizarin crimson. 
So the reflected light in there also takes some of the harshness out of these black lines as well. Just softens it all up a little bit, but making it look realistic. The colours of these cubicle rocks are predominantly a rusty red colour. And once I'd established that, I then added some yellows in there. So my mix more predominantly had yellow ochre and even a small amount of cadmium yellow in there as well. This is where I can use my most saturated colour right here in the foreground. There was more reflected light to be painted and then I worked on some of those creamier coloured rocks as well that are halfway up the cliff face here. I'm even now using number one and number zero round brushes for that much finer details. Now as I said before I have never painted a scene like this so I really took my time with it and the reason I focused on this area in the foreground first is to me that was the hardest area to paint so I kind of wanted to get it out of the way first. It also gave me more confidence with this painting to carry on with the rest of it. I finished up this painting session by doing some more work on the clouds and sky and then I allowed it to dry again. After that I started working on the other rock formations, so the background cliffs where the waterfall is. And what I did here was I started reinforcing where some of those cracks and fissures are within the scene. Now as this is one of the furthest zones away in the painting, I don't want to go too crazy with the details. Just a suggestion of details, and I don't want to overcomplicate it on the eye either because it could distract from the composition and spoil it. So much more sparingly on the details and I'm just working over some of these rock formations, painting in more colour, again using the same colours that I used during the block-in stage. I was on the next painting sesh when I was working on this part of it on these rock formations and again allowing a lot of time to work in the details. So what I did here just like the rocks in the foreground is I spent time painting more cracks and fissures within the sides of the rocks again using a mix of ultramarine blue with some burnt sienna but this time some titanium white so the values of those occlusion shadows are a little bit lighter than the occlusion shadows in the foreground and that's going to help these rocks and cliff faces to sit within the midground. I was starting to use smaller brushes as well, mainly a combination of number three flat and filbert brushes. So as I worked across there, I painted in the occlusion shadows and then I started to paint in some of these areas of the rocks where there's half tones and shadows, but there's also some warmth in those rocks as well. I created the heat within those rocks using mainly a mix of burnt sienna, titanium white and a little bit of ultramarine blue. There's also some alizarin crimson in there as well, but predominantly burnt sienna in the mix. Then following that, I started painting the areas of these rock faces that are in light. Again, using burnt sienna with some yellow ochre, titanium white and alizarin crimson. I also worked back across these shadow areas, communicating these cubicle rocks. And again, painting that warmth in them by predominantly having burnt sienna in my mix. Now when you're painting something like this, this shadow area, and you want to add some colour to it as well, is just keep in mind the value and make sure that the value is roughly the same kind of level. In this case also, I wanted to make sure that the colours aren't overly saturated either so that it doesn't leap forward in the painting. Now here I was painting in some of these greyer, more creamy coloured stones that are again in shadow and using the same colours that I've used mostly throughout these other rocks and for the clouds as well. Ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, titanium white and a little alizarin crimson but there's more ultramarine blue and titanium white in the mix. The brushes I used for this part of the painting were mainly a combination of number three filbert brushes, flat brushes, also number two flat brushes, and number one and number zero round brushes. And when I was getting to that really much finer details, like in this part here, I was using much smaller brushes. This is a number zero round brush. Overall, I was building up the form and texture of these rocks and adding lighter layers where the sunlit faces of these cliffs are. Following that, I then did some work on the water as this is the main zone of the painting that I haven't touched since the block-in stage. There was the mist coming off the waterfall and I was applying the paint here with a half-inch dagger brush. 
you can get some really nice effects with these. Also, I find that bristle dagger brushes are great for painting the suggestion of droplets of water or sparkles as well. I then worked on the water in the foreground, painting some more of those ripples. Using the same colours that I was using in the block-in stage, which was mainly ultramarine blue with yellow ochre, a little bit of titanium white and a small amount of burnt sienna. And then painting the other areas of the ripples where it's reflecting the sky. Here I'm using a number three filbert brush, again using that rounded edge which is great for painting ripples within the water. There was also the reflections from the waterfall to paint in as well. And then I started working on the foam that's in the water here, making that more cohesive. And it's also helping to direct the eye towards the waterfall, which is the main focal area of the painting. So I was also using a number three filbert brush to paint the foam in the water. And I was just tidying up the painting as well, making sure that it looks properly level and three dimensional. As with all of my paintings, I save my lightest values towards the end of it. And here I started to paint the highlights on the waterfall here using my lightest colors. And this was titanium white with just a small amount of yellow ochre. And the yellow ochre just warms up the white so it doesn't look cold. And then I was sparingly adding highlights to the waterfalls. I was also using my bristle dagger brush to paint some more of those droplets of water. And then I finished up the painting by just tidying up some of these various forms within it, reshaping some of the cliffs, filling in the negative spaces around them with the sky mix, and just adding a little bit more details to the water in the foreground. Now overall, I have to say I really enjoyed painting this. It was pretty challenging, but I'm quite happy with myself having painted this as it's something I've wanted to paint for a while, especially since seeing Andrew Tischler's paintings in the first place, which is what drew me to his work. I do hope to one day visit the Kimberley region in Australia. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did be sure to give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Once again thanks to Andrew Tischler for giving me the reference photo to allow me to paint this. Also check out Andrew's YouTube channel, he's an amazing artist, one of the best out there and I've put the link in the description box below. Now if you'd like to learn more about painting landscapes then check out the free painting resources I have on my website at samuelerp.com. I've got a painting blog there with written painting tutorials, also full length painting tutorial videos which are available for sale. And you can also get instant access to all of those painting tutorial videos and more by subscribing to me on Patreon for just $5 a month. Each month you get a brand new full length painting tutorial video, plus reference photos, lesson notes. I also upload extended time lapse videos and other bonus content. Plus you get all the access to all the previous videos of which there's over two years worth there. So it's like a landscape painting course. As I say, all for just $5 a month and I've put the link in the description box below. Now, just before you go, I'll tell you about a couple of other things. If you'd like to get a copy of my free ebook, introduction to oil painting, then you can get that by subscribing to my email list on my website. Again, the link is in the description box below. And lastly, just before I let you go, I now have some NFTs available for sale, non-fungible tokens. They're available on crypto.com and I've put the link in the description box below. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Have a beautiful day and I'll see you in the next video.